Hello, everybody. a little bit more. Recording again. Okay. Uh, right. Okay, do you guys see my screen? Do you see my screen? Yes, yes. Yes. Okay, great. Yes. Okay, cool. So, um, welcome everybody. Um, so this is the uh, create for the design for multi planetary species. Uh, we are at the week nine of our program. Um, we have uh, at least we have two guests right now. Um, so uh, I would like the guests just to uh, make a really short introduction of themselves, if that's okay. So if uh, Celine or Michael, if you are ready to share your, your camera and just say a few words about yourself. Hi. Um, I'm in pajamas, so I, <laughs> I'll save you guys from the video, but um, super excited to hear about your projects. The class seems super cool. Um, I'm a UX designer, but I come from an ID background, so I'm, I'm all about this uh, speculative design stuff as well, so really looking forward. Thank you. And so you used to work for uh, Ogilvy, the advertising company, but you yeah. have a background in like sculpture or or? Yeah, the work that I did is kind of all over the place. It was somewhere in between design and sculpture, sort of like functional objects, but with a really artistic thinking and approach. Um, and in marketing, I ended up doing everything. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> okay. uh, then we have Zera Kaitati, who is here. Zera, would you like to say a few words about yourself? Okay, we have Zera and Martin. Um, Zara and Martin, would you like to say a few words about yourself? Oh. I hear you. Ah, uh, would can you like you to? Us? Yeah, we can hear you, but you need to get a bit closer, I think. It's not very loud. Um, would you like to say a few words about yourself, Martin and Zara? Um, where are you calling from and what's your, what's your background, maybe? If they don't hear, maybe uh, Michael, could you go uh, forward and uh, make a quick introduction? Hi everyone, my name is Michael. I'm an industrial designer by trade and profession. And I studied in Sydney at UTS. Um, and I also studied in a, a university in Mexico and a university in Spain as an exchange. And I, my main experience in design was um, designing medical equipment in Vietnam for sort of low resource hospitals and for neonatal wards uh, for babies, premature babies. And now I'm working at Maker Bay and continuing my industrial design career with Cesar and helping to design robot boats 
and I'm Anthony Carl. Thank you. Nice to meet you all. Uh, Zara and Martin, uh, would you like to make a quick self-introduction? Uh, sure. Yes, sure. Um, so um, Zara and Martin, we work together. So we, um, we're founders of AI neuroscience startup, Mind. Um, so we're developing novel neurotechnology for measuring mental states in real time. Um, we can tell more about the uh, technology after, but we also started Mars Society London, um, which is a not-profit organization, and we work with different um, entrepreneurs, designers, and kind of multidisciplinary uh, practitioners to kind of educate and encourage uh, work um, towards uh, Mars. Yeah, I, I, I think uh, I think we'll be seeing more of each other anyway over the next weeks. As um, not sure, I'm not sure it says or if uh, we miss that if you've, if that's uh, if that's been communicated already. Uh, yes, I, I told them about you guys, um, uh, but this is the first time to meet you. So maybe you wanna maybe just say, like just like Zara, just a few words about yourself, your background. Uh, I will I will introduce you in a lot more detail later, but just uh, just introduction. Okay, sure, sure. Uh, but so yeah, like Zara said, um, you know, we we started this company, Mind, um, and we're building this mental state feedback technology, and we can talk more about that at another point later. Uh, I worked on, I did my PhD at Imperial uh, College in London, and I worked on brain computer interfaces uh, for human augmentation, um, but. Uh, yeah, so that's that's um, that's kind of the short version, really. Let's let's leave it at that. I want to hear from them. Yeah, right my now. background is so I come from design background, which is how uh, Cesar and I met originally quite some time ago. Um, and yeah, since then I've been involved in different projects on the you know, um, intersection of design, technology, and science, neuroscience specifically is something I'm interested in. And then over the last years, kind of got more involved in space initiatives. Great. Awesome. So thanks a lot for the, for the quick self-introduction. Uh, so without further ado, so just to set up the scene and tell you who's going to play which role uh, within this. Uh, we also have uh, Maria Lot E. Uh, Maria, do you want to make a quick self-introduction? And Chiki as well, a really quick one. Hello, um, this is Chiki here. I am the CEO of Makeabay. And um, specifically um, to the program, actually, I'm a computer engineer by background. Uh, but in the last 20 years, I've been doing a lot of software development and program management. Um, yeah, and I'm excited to see what you guys are coming up with. I don't have much background in space, but um, happy to learn. Thank you. And Maria? Oh, hi. Um, yeah, so I am Maria, uh, uh, working at Make a Bay, and then I also have not much um, knowledge about space and Mars, but I read the Martian novel, and, your background and I is, like it. <laughs> and your background is in biology. Yeah, my background is in biology. I will also wonder, like, can we someday, how can we survive on Mars? So I guess you'll have lots, lots of questions. Yeah. <laughs> Great. So uh, today the students are going to present, so we have 12 of them, and they are answering the brief. Uh, oh, sorry, did I miss somebody? No, okay. Um, so the brief is going to be about how we design for uh, living on Mars and everyday objects. So the idea is more about kind of the, the banal and the extraordinary things that we're going to need to live on Mars. Oops, sorry. Uh, and so uh, this is the, the brief, but in one sentence, is that we're going to be, uh, the, the students have uh, going to show you objects that they think would be part of the everyday life on Mars. So they can be about essential needs, or they can respond to also higher needs. So they can be about uh, how people think and psychology. So they don't have to be just like uh, first necessities like surviving like water and food and shelter. Uh, they can also be of a, of a higher necessity. Uh, we have worked uh, on nine weeks on these projects. So this was the, the, um, the different uh, uh, work that we have done. They had one lecture by Dr. Um, ben Hayun. 
uh, who is an artist who works a lot with the uh, space scientists. Uh, but apart from this, they have been mostly working on trying to uh, learn about uh, Mars technology and what it would take to, to be there. So today, the presentation that you're going to see, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's the first crit, which means that we're trying to uh, evaluate the work of the students. So there's gonna be an evaluation on 50 points. So there's gonna be uh, eight points for the, for the background and research. So is the research you know, relevant and does it make sense? Is it based on realities of Mars? Uh, nine points on creativity. Is this something that you have never seen before? It's ex exciting and new. Uh, technology and innovation. Is it proposing a vision of technology or an application of technology that is novel and interesting, uh, conscious and critical? It's, um, is this thoughtful? Is it not just you know, something that is just um, flashy and, and cool, but is it also like critical and, and, uh, and provoke insights? Uh, eight points on sustainability. Uh, is this approach of technology and design a way to build a sustainable Mars? And nine on the quality of the presentation. So the visual, uh, the quality of the visuals and the quality of the, of the presentation overall. So those, uh, I'm not gonna ask you to, um, to like write your own form. I've prepared a form for you. Uh, and I'm going to ask you uh, to scan this QR code that you have here. I'm also going to share, I'm also gonna share that link uh, in the chat. Uh, so, um, so if you could click on that link, or scan this on your mobile phone. Uh, I would like you to go there. So uh, just two things that are very important about the form. So every student who is gonna speak, uh, so those criteria, you have to uh, rate them. The students will rate each other as well. Uh, very, very important. At the very end, don't forget to press on the button submit. Uh, so none of the questions are mandatory. If you take a bio break in the middle because you, you are missing one presentation, it's okay, don't worry about it. Um, even if you don't fill all the fields, that's okay. The only uh, mandatory one are the three first one, your email, your name, uh, and that's, that's about it. The rest is, uh, is optional. Uh, you will see as well that at the end of each individual student presentation, there is a field for comments. So if you see uh, the student and you, you think, oh, this project is interesting, it reminds me of that work, and you want to suggest a reference, or if you have a suggestion, you feel that, oh, okay, you could go more in this direction. Uh, you could give individual feedback for the students or you could give a feedback overall. Um, so I just wanna make sure before we move on, has everybody had the time to, uh, to scan this QR code? Everybody has the QR code? Yeah? Okay, so uh, without further ado, the running order is going to be uh, the following. Uh, so I would like the student to, uh, to make sure that they, uh, they have this. I'm gonna copy and paste it as well in the chat. Uh, so every student uh, is going to have three minutes of presentation and it will be followed by two minutes of Q and A. Yeah, are we, are we good? I think we have a few more guests that have joined in, but uh, but I think we should we should just uh, we should just jump in. Okay, so I've stopped sharing my screen, so I'm going to call uh, Yui to start the first presentation. Hi. Uh, yeah. Can you see my screen? Uh, yes, you will. Yes, we can see the screen. Um, okay, yeah, so I'm gonna just go and start. Um, so hi everyone, my topic is about food on Mars and how we can design food production systems for life on Mars. And I started my research by looking at um, what kind of food that we could have on Mars. And I came with the conclusion that the main food source we could have would be microbes because they are highly customizable so we, they can meet our nutritional needs. They grow fast, they need low effort to take care of, and they produce a lot less waste compared to plants or meat. And the other aspect that I looked into is the approach that we would need for life on Mars, which would be sort of low tech and self-sufficient because we don't have the luxury of getting resources from Earth. And so with these two things in mind, um, 
I looked at how we produce microbes uh, right now at an industrial scale using bioreactors, which are very big and heavy machines, um, but they have several key components like here. And so I thought, how can we take these key components and repackage them so that they are more compact, they're lighter, they're less energy intensive, and they're less complicated so we can transport them and we can maintain and fix them on Mars. So with that came the first two uh, prototypes, which took up quite a lot of space because they had hard shells. Um, so I moved on to look at and looked at soft aesthetics. So I thought, how could we replace these hard shells with sort of bags and everything that we need for a bioreactor would go to a model up top, and we only have need to put water and the microbes within a bag. So after that, I came to the first working prototypes with these features. So on top, we have a master control panel, which have a few LEDs for warnings and a screen for sensor readings. Uh, and then, um, and then I kept the master control to be very open, so I can take things in and out very easily, and so to see. So it's easier to repair, and that's, I think it's a, a requirement that we need for designing objects on Mars. And so the product meets basically most of the needs for a bioreactor so far, except being antibacterial and being able to control the temperature. And, but it is a lot more compact and lighter than a normal bioreactor would. So looking forward, uh, how would we go about sort of developing more about this product? So the first thing that I would think of is having the soft container which I couldn't get uh, due to COVID-19, um, but and then adding another heating element so we could control the temperature and adding more sensors so we can add, see the nutritional values of the water, a cleaner and lighter dashboard. Um, so this dashboard that I have currently created weighs roughly 400 grams, but there's still a lot of space for it to be trimmed off and being more lighter and more compact. And looking at how this can be more scalable so seeing how one dashboard could control more containers or how these containers could be arranged so that they are more space efficient. And the last thing that I would like to mention is we sort of lose this aspect of this feeling of uh, joy when we farm, um, when we grow microbes on Mars like this. So another step I think would be sort of looking at how we can cultivate other things like seaweed, which have the same uh, structure like algae, but are looks like a plant, so they bring back some of that mental health ability of farming, um, which could really benefit our crew in space. And yeah, and that's the end of my presentation. Thank you. We'd like to have the questions from the uh, from the audience. So you have two minutes for the for the questions. Uh, hi, you. It is Carson here. Yep. Um, can I watch the video? Because it looks like it'll be insightful. Uh, yeah. It's mostly. It's just uh, showing the thing at work. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Thank you. Hey there, it's Martin. Uh, just wanted to ask what, uh, like, how is this powered? You know, on Mars, it's going to be a bit trickier generating power, you know? Um, so, so, yeah. Yeah. And so this is actually powered with a 12 volt uh, source. Um, and I already looked into sort of the aspects of. So right now we have a lot of solar uh, panels that could try to actually power this already. Um, I just didn't have the time to think of that aspect yet. Um, but yeah, I think this actually requires not a lot of power. So it's just a normal 12 volt uh, power source and maybe like a small battery. Okay, sure, that makes sense. And then obviously if the container is bigger, you'd need more volts, more current. And so you need bigger batteries or solar panels hooked up to this, right? Um, yeah, but I think uh, 
the good thing about this is that it's mostly the most battery that goes in here, and the most power that goes in here are just for lighting and so sort of the air sort of agitation. So it, it, at the end of the day, you don't really need a lot of power. So it's mostly you have a good enough LEDs and you have a sufficient enough pump. Um, that's cool. the main power that you need. Nice. Thanks. Yui, um, this is Chiki here. Um, do you have an estimation of how long does it take to actually generate these um, microbes? And also, um, because it's something which is going to be uh, consumed, so what is the quantity that's required per person? Um, um, so I haven't looked into how much a person would require yet, but yeah. usually um, for, for, for example, for this is a five liter um, bottle, and usually with the starting culture, it takes around uh, two to three weeks to sort of get a bit less than this, but it's roughly just uh, this. Um, but again, uh, I think for microbes that we use in space, so the good thing that we can have about them is that we can gently modify them so we can have like them having nutritional values, but we are also make them grow faster or grow much with a lot more mass than we uh, have on Earth. So that's, I think it's a good thing as well. And I think that's something that we can use in conjunction with the, the product here. Are there any atmospheric conditions on Earth? So it's, a, it's already three minutes, so we have to okay. move, otherwise we, we won't. Uh, thanks a lot, Yui. Uh, the next person to go is the um, is uh, Anson. Yes. Yep. Um. Yep. Yep. Okay, so I I didn't really name my project yet, so I just call it habitation for now. So uh, I wanted to make Mars really a home for human for mankind and not some temporary research center. So I asked the question, can we live on Mars just like the way we live on Earth? Not only in the house scale, but also maybe in bigger scales. So the Buckminster Fuller Dome came to my mind immediately, and I tried to render the first prototype. It kind of look, looks cool, but it lacks of uniqueness, I would say. And then I experimented different shapes and forms, trying to uh, maximize the interior spaces, at the same time improves airflow. But uh, after Nelly's lecture, she reminded me to think more about the human elements for the Mars habitation. And as I do my research, professional teams actually propose the Martian geodesic dome already, and I clearly need some breakthrough. So I refocus the, uh, on the Martian's health. As their bone and muscle will keep losing in the microgravity, they will end up being weak and easily injured. So I modify my design to make it more kind of annoying, as in people can only get in and out the structure through walking at least 150 meters and climbing five meters of height every time, through walking a circular path and climb the artificial landscape. And this landscape are shaped it as the rocket landing pods, as I plan to reuse the rocket heads as, uh, for the Martian to, uh, when they get to Mars at the very first time. So this is some of the fuel point inside. And then I moved to leisure and then I did it as a collaboration with Carson, another design for student, and integrating his smart stadium into my city complex modeling. And this is the top view of the structure and you can see the landscape and the arc tip um, creates an open space for Mars parking. And then, yeah, the shape kind of looks like this uh, pop culture symbols. And the side, from the side view, we can see that the structure has four sections and then from the main entrance, the Martian walk past as a cave market. And while they see a peak of the stadium and a garden through the divergent roof design, and then the main atrium uh, installed the stadium and grandstands. And I also modified the, float, the floating pillars as four little grandstands. So there are five viewing points for the stadium. And I integrated the walk more style pathway from the previous model and for the audience. And as the stadium is transparent, everyone in the atrium can enjoy the game. The next section is the garden park where the artificial landscape provided greeneries for people to chill on. And at the same time, um, the housing the life support mach machineries beneath it. And this is the view looking back at the atrium. 
The final section is the government complex where the Martian crew run, run the errands and the art design should host different counters along the corridor, but I didn't have time to draw the detail yet. And last but not least is the construction planning. And they shall be feasible as I looked into different NASA award-winning teams and retrieved their building methods, including the use of Martian resources and the reuse of rocket landing pods. My project achieved the sustain sustainability goals in these three different aspects. And this is all of my presentation, and I believe it's the Q&A time. Bonjour! Can you hello. hear me? This is this yeah, working? Hello, hello everybody. I'm sorry, first of all, that I cannot join for all the presentation, but uh, it's been amazing to see the development. Uh, so, Anson, I had a question for you. Did you test out any of these drawings or made any mock-ups or any models in your uh, bedroom? <laughs> uh, no, that, that, that's because um, I cannot really go and buy the materials at this time. And I tried to find some application to kind of test the wind flows. Um, maybe let me show. Um, I mean, I think given the current constraint you have as well, it would have been interesting to, you know, and I would, have, I would encourage you also to do it still, to actually use anything that is inside your kitchen or so forth to actually make some of this shape. I mean, obviously, the aesthetics would be extremely different, but that is also interesting because if you start to think about the way that uh, objects have been made on the International Space Station, for example, they have a very DIY aesthetics. Right, so maybe yes. that aesthetic that you have is kind of the vision of you know some of this potential habitat. But the reality is, if you only have like six forks to actually come up with a, a, a new form of architecture, then the question for you is, how do you do it? So it will be interesting for you to twist your mind within the constraint that you're into and still be able to test out things and still be able to experiment with shapes. Yes. Yeah, I will try to do it Thank later. You. Thank Next. you. Next. <laughs> we have another three seconds for a short question. Uh, hey, Anson Martin from Mind. Uh, nice presentation, interesting concept. Um, you should I, I don't know if you thought about it but you know the buildings would have to be covered with a lot of regolith and so on to protect from you know shielding right to protect from radiation and uh micrometeorites falling on mars all the time um yes. have you thought about that yeah um there's uh, i included here in the construction brief maybe i should talk about it more because uh, i tried to find the building methods that's another winning team they did it which is the wind blow topsoil and the ice water and those team actually test, I, I think they, they kind of did the math and stuff, and they, they think that these materials can actually block the radiation already. So uh, I plan on using these materials, and I feel like it should have the same effects, but just uh, yeah, it, in it, different forms and shapes. Exactly, exactly. The topsoil, yeah, the, they call it the regolith on yeah, Mars. Yeah, uh, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Nice. It's, it's quite a significant part of the, it'll have to probably be quite a significant part of the building design on, on Mars. Cause you know, like it's, there's a lot of radiation and it's very cold as well, obviously. So it's quite a, quite a hostile environment. Yeah, true. Okay. Yeah. Good job. Thank good you. job. Yeah. Thank you. So, so the next is Carson. And I understand that Carson and Anson, you kind of work together. So it's a, it's a good se sequence, I imagine. So Carson, are you ready to go? So keep an eye on my uh, display. When your time is up, I will bring the, the display very close to the screen so you can see that uh, the time is up. I, I want to be fair to everybody, so. Okay, you ready to go? Hi, uh, yeah, I'm ready, okay. Uh, hi, it's Carson here. Um, my project is on loops, so it's a uh, leisure and sports game based in data and since infrastructure design. Sorry. So loops is a game that basically revolves around the techno the absence of gravity in which we have two thirds less of gravity on Mars. Therefore, everything is basically expanded by the multiple of three. Therefore, this basketball field system right here is actually 90 times 45 meters court that covers 
inside Anson's design. The stadium design comes a ability of different arcs as it could adapt to different locations as it needs to fit into different upcoming locations such as craters on Mars, round type of dome designs or square designs. So the arc structure will allow it to stay afloat while the translucent skin faces are a type of design in which can keep the players inside while the game is playing. The render structure as shown by Anson before is collaboration in which we focused it on the habitat view as a creating a community on Mars that could be able to have leisure time while playing sports and seeing competition. The gameplay could be also split into two versus two or three versus three as it would allow it to be because of how vast the playing space is as events such as Mars versus Earth League would happen because there's a rebound on five different walls that the ball could be bounced around towards. So it's a combination kind of squash and basketball. With the apparel design, I focused towards protection and flexibility as this had to reinforce uh, stress areas in which the players had to be able to move around in. I based it off of some Arcteryx products such as Alpha SV in which had robust areas and flexibility areas in which the pattern making was well enough for athletics. Uh, for the footwear department, I knew that the old boot design as you've seen here would not be sufficient because of the immense of height you would gain during a jump. I looked towards having more carbon balance plate design and a more natural footbed in which I looked towards the Aston Martin Valkyrie and how the functionality of the bouncing of a dart, poison dart frog would be in the design of the shoe. So at the end, I came up with the Endure Elite in which it comes up with designing a design that could have full ground contact while the top upper of the shoe is used of a hyperskin material. So it would wrap the athlete's foot as well as possible. Thank you. Great, thanks a lot. So the questions? Um, hello, Anson, this is Michael. Um, thank you for your presentation. I loved your sketching. Um, I like that you focused on kind of sports that involves social collaboration as Marshall's point is. I was wondering what consideration you thought about, what consideration you had in, in the use of oxygen in the, in the stadium. Um, so back to design in which this arc system is type of a more futuristic material approach in which I think material science today does not have the current technology. Um, I think the translucent skin as shown by my sketching here would be uh, breathable in which Anson's pressurized chamber environment would actually have good airflow into the system. But yet this bubble itself would also keep itself intact while the players were in the system. Okay, thanks. Um, thank you for the presentation. And can you tell us what is the gravity situation on Mars? The gravity situation on Mars is basically two thirds off of Earth's weight. So imagine jumping one meter on Earth in which you would jump three meters on Mars. So um, how does that maybe change the way that we produce and think about sport? Because You're ultimately- about Sports on a greater dimension because of the abilities and lengths you can actually transcend to, but because of the uh, lesser gravity, you would grip less on ground surfaces. Therefore, I created a shoe that would try and emulate as much of a natural footbed while keeping your uh, body as much ground contact with the floor as possible. But what I mean by that is that maybe actually your set of reference, because right now they are coming from the actual world of sport on earth, right? You're thinking in terms of reference of basketball and squash, which we have on earth, but ultimately when you're on Mars, it's a different story. So maybe your set of reference should be more taken from, you know, aerospace or the red arrow, you know, like all of these kind of sport that take place usually in the air or that play especially with, um, you know, that exists more within that field as opposed to the field of sport. So maybe it would be interesting to kind of completely reshape your way of thinking 
because ultimately the way that we think of sport on Mars is going to be very drastically different from the way that it is on planet Earth. You know, the idea that you would just replicate the same pattern from a place to another, perhaps is something that I would like you to, to challenge moving forward. Because why would you need a shoe if you're not going to be, um, you know, touching the floor? You will touch the floor because there's still does have gravity. So the amount of emergency power that you jump up and crash back down wouldn't need sufficient cushioning. Basically, what I'm trying to say here is you can be very playful with that because uh, ultimately the floor and the places where you, you know, the time they would take you to go down is going to be very different than the one that we are here. So you can already start to think in terms of you know, maybe in your game, there is a rule that if you go lower or if you go faster up than lower, then maybe something else is happening or, you know, and so forth. So perhaps it would be interesting to look at it maybe with an eye that, um, you know, is actually really playing with the, with the potential of the, you know, of this planet. Thanks so much. I have to, uh, to move on. But uh, thanks for the feedback. That's very, very useful. Um, would you mind stop sharing your uh, screen? And uh, Winnie, I'm going to ask you to get ready. Yes. Winnie, are you ready? Yes. Um, you can how can on, I? You can press on share screen, which would be a green button at the bottom in the center. Oh, okay. Share screen. Yeah. Okay. Oh, wow. Um, so this is my final product M20. So my idea is to create a trend and an outfit for everyday on use on Mars. So these are the two main things I need to include when design, designing in my design. So Mars range from a negative, one, one, like negative 140 to 30 degrees Celsius. So in my design has to be warm enough to wear it with extreme weather. And also uh, the weight have to be included. Oh, so these are the prototype from last presentation and the sketches from last presentation. So I, got it, so I gathered um, Dr. Nally's and Caesar's comments. So I'll be foc focusing on more on trends, appearance rather than function. Um, so, so these are the trends that artists inspired from space on earth. So what I gathered from these garments are usually reflective silver, which is inspired by astronaut outfit and futuristic and sharp. So, but should I follow these trend on earth or make a new trend? So, um, so this is what I wanted to, to be the first trend on Mars, which is layers. So um, I got my inspiration from astronaut garment, which has a lot of um, a layers to keep them warm and safe. So therefore um, I developed my sketch, which I chose the middle, um, middle one. So according to Dr. Snelly's comment, I added, added some of my own uh, culture related stuff. So which is the Chinese knots. And um, I'll talk in that later. So this is my final prototype. So I made a life size garment using a sewing machine and a scuba fabric, which is a non biodegradable material. So um, from the hood, I've added a UV uh, mask just here and so that users will not get hurt on or, uh, or burn their eyes from albedo. So albedo is like a, a amount of solar energy that gets reflected off and on land and back on space. So as you can see the garments are use, usually layered. So on the shoulder there are, there are holes with carbon carabiner which is a function that could hold users in place. So, um, so this is the Chinese knot so it, it represents luckies uh, in Chinese culture. So I added a pink string, uh, as you can see in the video, so ma to match the outfit and prevent the, um, the knot from um, breaking it. Um, so this is my um, Chinese knot belt. Um, so it's, a, it's, it's pretty and at the same time, it's also functional. So to do this is to um, unhook the, from the belt and then hook back on the shoulder and then hook somewhere else. So basically, um, so this is the last um, slide. So this is like a reflective, as you can see. And so it's a safety um, for users. 
So um, when you're inside a building, the users could unbutton the UV um, mask. Thank you. Thank you so much. So we'd like to have the questions. Many. This is Celine. Um, thanks so much for your presentation. Really beautiful uh, prototype, shall we say. Um, my question regarding your choice of petroleum-based scuba fabric is, uh, it begs the question that when you're on Mars, if you don't have a connected supply chain to Earth, how do you imagine that we would be able to source materials long-term? Or do you have an idea of maybe a recycling system um, in order to sustain that supply chain? Um, so, like, the garment will produce on Earth and then will kind of ship or um, um, to Mars. So, and and at the same time, because scuba fabric is um, recyclable, so um, when you finish or you kind of um, uh, you want to change up something, you, you just recycle it, and then um, and then there's like uh, maybe a a bunch of people can use it, and it's just like um, uh, you, you you won't waste any materials on Mars. Yeah, that's it. So, do you imagine this would impact the way that we view clothes and fashion in the way that? On Earth, because we're able to produce to infinity, we consume clothes versus in Mars. Do you imagine it will be a very utilitarian take on fashion? Um, yes, it won't be the same as on Earth because, like, there's like a fast fashion and and stuff like because like a fast pace of fashion um, um, time, but in on Mars. It, um, I want to be like a uh, more sustainable, like to use any fab uh, any fabric or materials that could to be used and also recycle. That's it. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. So we need amazing that you managed to do a prototype. I mean, it's uh, very it's like kudos to you, especially in the current condition. You know, well done. Um, I mean, I'd say it's also really interesting for me to see how you connected it back to your own culture and some, you know, some of the elements that you mentioned, the knot. Now, what I would love to see is actually, you know, maybe that knot being taken to a scale that is actually the scale of the garment. Because right now, you just use that knot as, you know, maybe one element of the outfit. But what if the outfit is in itself just a knot, you know, where everything is about attachment? So I show you my astronaut outfit, you know, the one that I was given by the, the agency. And you know, there is all this scratching pattern and actually a big part of that outfit is just the, the function of being able to attach, you know, yourself straight into the surfaces of the shuttle. Um, so maybe actually the next phase of that is actually maybe losing, maybe the layers are actually just the knot, like the entire fit, outfit is that uh, little knot or that little system that you have just used and focus on the belt, but that to the scale of the entire garment. I would love to see that. Okay, thank you. And, and just a very quick remark as well, like for the sourcing of the material, uh, for example, I sent you a video for how to produce rock wool. You can actually produce fabric from rocks um, and it's very uh, insulating as well. So, um, so you want to look into that. I think that's a, that's a promising uh, direction. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. If you can stop sharing your screen. Perfect. Uh, after we have uh, Oscar. Yeah, uh, can you see my screen? Uh, yes, we're ready okay. for you. Okay, um, hello, so my name is Oscar Wong and today I'm gonna to show you my Mars Everyday Objects, which is separated into two parts, which is seaweed lime biomaterial and extruder gum. Um, so to first give uh, some inspiration, uh, I was inspired by AI Space Factory and their limitations on the 3D printed habitat. So one, their biomaterial has an intensive uh, embedded water resource as they use uh, corn as their main uh, fiber for material. And secondly, uh, they, use, they have to use a large robot arm apparatus uh, to 3D print habitat. And this uh, gives a lack of accessibility for future Mars citizens and also lack of convenience overall. So uh, this led me into formulating the research question, how can the intensive demand in resources printing, uh, resources and 3D printing technology be effective and accessible through 
different aspects of Mars life. Um, so first off, I researched on what materials and compositions can be found on Mars, and I stumbled upon a diagram on NASA, NASA showcasing uh, calcium-rich veins uh, in Martian rocks. Moreover, there's a report showcasing that there's calcium carbonate uh, at the Phoenix, uh, Mars Phoenix landing site. So through this, I realized that calcium carbonate is uh, probably one of the material components within uh, Mars. So therefore, I researched into biomaterials that could be used with calcium carbonate and also have a low embedded water resource. So I therefore researched on traditional Japanese lime plasters, which actually use uh, hydrated lime and uh, seaweed as an active uh, adhesion for the powder. Um, and that's essentially what I did, but uh, substituting uh, from a prototype, but substituting it with uh, agar agar. Um, and so this is the process. Uh, so the material itself um, is durable and somewhat buoyant. Uh, it has resistance when applying pressure. Uh, there's numerous uh, positive qualities for the material. Uh, it sets around four minutes initial setting and 10 minutes for a uh, full set. Uh, and also the material can actually be reactivated by heat and water. So um, it can be sustainable uh, after creating a form. If uh, the resident doesn't like it, he can just uh, reheat it. Um, and also, more importantly, uh, the, act, the actual material itself is thick enough for it to layer upon itself, um, which is perfect for extrusion, uh, which is, uh, leads into my second part of the uh, project, which is a portable extruder. Um, due to the fact that the material can be reactivated by heat, I uh, realized that the, um, uh, a low prototype would be a glue gun, which could, but instead of using a plastic uh, glue material, it could be used like a a cartridge of a biomaterial and also extrapolating that with like different refills on like uh, garments on gloves. So um, to sum up, the foundation of this design, uh, we can extrapolate the concept of the production of seaweed onto other aspects such as a production of food or production of a green space to further the usefulness and justification of the pro uh, production of seaweed by placing it into different aspects of Mars with life. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Question? Hello, Oscar. This is yeah. Michael speaking. Excellent presentation, excellent research and experimentation. I was wondering, um, you mentioned that the, the material could be reactivated with heat and hence mm -hmm. re reusable, which is very advantageous. But what about with the high heat on Mars and solar radiation? Mm -hmm. Is there a risk of it um, melting in the sun? So you would need yeah. some catalyzer to keep it hardened um, in use. Yeah, so that's one consideration that um, I knew I couldn't uh, test, which is like the radiation, the radiation levels for like people uh, going into the habitat as well as um, the heat, uh, like the heat, uh, melting the actual form of the biomaterial. Um, I haven't figured out a solution to uh, make the agar agar like not melt, but possibly I think it's to do with the various ratios of um, various ratios of agar agar and uh, calcium car uh, hydroxide. Um, I actually can show you um, like my different uh, sorry. Uh, I can show you uh, like my prototypes. So this is my first one, uh, or, or not first one, my final one. Oh, it's like this. And so this is like basically a brick. But then my later, uh, my just just to butt in, we're currently yeah. viewing your desktop. Is that what we're meant to be looking oh. at? Oh, uh, sorry. Well, can you see my screen? Now I can see okay. you. Okay, wait, wait uh, sorry, um, let me turn this. Okay, so for my first prototype, um, I experimented with different ratios. So this is like, it's a much more craggy, um, and I guess the different ratios would allow for different boiling points and melting points. So this one, as you can see, it's much more fine um, because I allowed it to, uh, the agar agar solution to melt more, so I guess, like the different ratios would uh, change the melting points. Excellent, thank you.
Thanks very much. And the next person to go is Nomi. Yeah. Hi, this is Nomi. Um, will humans really move to Mars one day? Will this feel strange and exclusive to this new home? Um, if we really want to enhance our sense of belongings to Mars, then maybe we need to make more contact with Mars and to create a culture unique to Mars. So my idea is to let people taste and listen to Mars, like collect, uh, collect information from Mars, like songs and images, and transform and process them into our daily life. Um, this is the first version which looks like a smartphone. And there are cameras and sound absorbers on one side and a touchable screen on the other side. The users uh, can adjust and generate music from the upper part of the screen and they can select the information elements they like to generate 3D food models. And this is another word. It is basically uh, the same as the formal one in function, but I have made some changes in its appearance and its usage. Uh, although it looks like a pair of telescope, it actually only has lens on one side and on the other side, uh, there is a sound absorber. And it can be used separately or combined together. Uh, I know this looks a little bit out of reality, so I'm going to briefly explain the working principle and I hope it could make it clear. So this is about listen to Mars. Um, as we know, uh, the sound can be transmitted and heard on Mars, but from the sounds that humans have already collected so far, most are uh, monotonous and harsh. So listen to Mars is to adjust the frequency and the tone of the collective songs and convert it to Mars-like music. And another part is about taste Mars. Uh, I think this is more bizarre, but the main work of this part is to use the information collected uh, information elements extracted from Mars images as references to design 3D printed food. And this can be the, could be the conversion precise, like from the image to models. And this is the whole concept of my design. And there are some explanations of what might be confusing, like, I know these devices can be used on Earth, but I think on Mars it is more useful and and more necessary. And I create this these two words in the shape that is more like daily life objects on Earth because I want to create new features and values through a familiar look. And I think this look is also a part of uh, creating the sense of belongings. And that's all. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I have a quick question. What do you feel, what do you think, or what do you anticipate Mars to taste like? Uh, I suggest it to be like the food on, on the earth. Oh, what I want to make, oh, what I think is novel is about its, oh, sorry, I want to, uh, it's about its shape, it's about its shape here, like, to change the shape of the food. But, but the taste is the same as on Earth? So why, why would you want to do uh, that? Because, because I, I think we need to use the same materials, like, we need to print it out through the materials we use on Earth. Like uh, in International Space 
uh, space station. We also use 3D printing to create food, and they, their materials are just like uh, some normal materials. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank the you. next person we have is Wendy. Yeah. Can you see my screen now? Yes. Okay. Um. So, um, so, uh, so uh, my question is how to put your Martian farm in your handbag. And since rocket delivery to Mars is expensive, and so it's really unrealistic to bring a large amount of food many times to Mars. Therefore, building a sustainable farm on Mars with the least volume and weight is crucial. However, the Martian conditions are similar to the primitive agricultural stage on Earth. Martian atmosphere lacks oxygen, while the Martian water is full of toxic perchlorates. The temperature fluctuates drastically 65,000 degrees every day, while Martian soil contains abundant heavy metals. So even though 10 kinds of crops are harvested in simulated Martian soil, no one dare to try the food due to the heavy metals. And additionally, it remains unclear whether there are side effects of deformed vegetables due to spatial radiations, thus directly grown crops on Martian soil seems not feasible. So I turn to Aaron Cornix, which is growing plants while exposing their roots in the air full of nutritious fall. And I also get inspiration from the MIT treehouse, um, which is um, circulating the solar power and water to generate heat and fuel. However, it takes um, many years to grow a tree. So, and I also refer to Marsha, which is designed by ASX factory. So uh, it can design the pretty prints, the Martian soil with the out external structure of the egg shape architecture to protect uh, to be radiation proof. Um, so, it, um, so I came up the idea with growing crops direct, directly on a grid wall which consists of mycelia structure because NASA finds that mycelia can block spatial radiation growing fast, easily strong and flexible and offering mushroom as food uh, like this green pavilion. Um, so they actually grow the mushroom on the solid medium and even produce the garment and the food mushroom. And this is my first prototype. Um, so um, I ordered it online. However, when it delivered to my home, it takes six days and I find it's um, kind of fail because um, although it composed the cotton seed host, corn, cob, jigsaw, brown, soil, flour, and water. Um, I find it grown, grown super hard that I can't even break them with my knife. So um, meanwhile, the solid medium is still too heavy and huge to launch. So therefore, I improved my second prototype, which is the mushroom crop skull existing umbrella structure. And so, I intended to grow it as uh, with the fabric, and this is from the Acrobative Design Studio, uh, which is called Microflex, and also the inspiration from Miss Li Jianlin, her growing mushroom from her hair, skin, and nail to sustain them. Um, so my design is to grow crops on a composite fabric, which has two mycelial surfaces with a middle layer of biodegradable fabric. And I try to make a fluid medium of cornmeal, brown, magnetism, sulfate, monopotassium, phosphate, and water, and then dip the fabric into it and see if mycelium and grow into weaving it. And after that, sewing it as the umbrella, and unfolding the umbrella on the Mars and a piece of this kind of fabric, so we can build a Martian mycelia girl farm. The volume and weight should be so small and light that you can put them in your handbag. And then I order the components online and do my experiments. And this is the wool fiber and the nutrition solution. And 
yeah, the mushroom has already grown the spore and wipe it as the experiment. And I also grow the soybean. Now, it, this morning I check it, it already grows very tall like this. And I also choose these five kinds of seeds because they can all be consumed raw, that you don't need to really cook them. And their roots already penetrate from it. Uh, so um, although I may not be able to test with the gravity less, but refer to NASA's um, cleanest step garden, it's demonstrated that crops can grow in gravity less condition. So I can continue my experiment and present it later. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, it's already five minutes. You went two minutes over, so uh, I would only uh, can only have one question. Hey, Wendy Martin from Mind here. A uh, really great presentation, and um, you know, mycelium has a lot of very nice uses, and fungi resist, uh, they have a lot of nice properties like resisting radiation, they can thrive in many different types of environments. So, so I love that. Uh, great idea, great presentation. Just uh, one question, sorry if I missed it. Um, I had to pop out of the room just br very briefly. Um, which type of fungus um, are you thinking here? Because, you know, they, they, they are very, they can be quite different. Maybe you mentioned it. Yeah, I try to use the same type as Miss Lee Jenny used the Pleuritus ostritus because it's the cheapest one I find and it mm -hmm. can and uh, so far it takes um, nine days to grow from the mycelia to the spore so it can grow very quickly yeah okay and the only thing I didn't hear about super quick is um, is is it uh, safe I mean fungi have uh, a lot of very beneficial properties uh, it's, a, it's a great organism to use um, but you know they, they can also cause health issues obviously like uh, the spores um, you know they float in the air what if you breathe them in that's the only thing I didn't hear about in your presentation any any thoughts um, on that? oh yeah so actually I um... I intend to grow the this kind of fabric on Earth first, and then uh, uh, because you can change the temperature and the humidity on Mars uh, with this controller, so uh, you can uh, decide um, to grow the spores um, outside, uh, like the out the external side of the fabric, not the inside, so the astronauts can avoid the uh, the allergic. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, you've obviously thought a lot about it and researched it. Thanks. Thanks for that great presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. So the next person to go is Fergal. Fergal, are you yep. ready? Yes. Oh, do you guys see my screen? Yeah. All right. Yes. All right. Hi, I'm Fergal. And um I want to start off today by talking about um, our fundamentals, and that is Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So it tells us that um, there are four basic uh, physiological needs that all humans need in order to survive. Food, water, warmth, and shelter. These are all needs that we all have on Earth and will be essential for us when we make leaps outside of our world and venture into outer space. The confirmation of the existence and the availability of ice water on Mars is a breakthrough to colonizing the planet and making it a habitable place. But there are still a lot of unanswered questions surrounding the topic. The two questions that emerge when I research about the topic of water as a means of survival on Mars is how will water be transported around for everyday purposes on Mars when the planet becomes colonized? And can water be kept at 25 degrees when traveling around Mars? The major constraint I found when trying to find a solution to these two um, problems is the issue of temperature difference between the two planets, so Earth and Mars. The temperature difference of, of 77 degrees makes it very difficult to terraform or emulate Earth habitat or environment on Mars. And my solution to this is the Martian bottle, which is a container that has the ability of heating up and melting Martian ice water and maintaining it at room temperature. 
allowing users to have a refreshing sip of water, whether they're exploring the Martian landscape or just hanging out with their friends. The product is intuitive and open to all users living on Mars. The user uses the product by first opening the lid of the container and putting margin ice water into the container so that the ice starts to melt and becomes a liquid state. The container then acts as a water bath through the use of coils, which heats up the water from, from the average temperature on Mars to the room temperature on Earth. So that will be tw um, 25 degrees. And that is maintained and regulated by a temperature sensor. When the user uses the container for a drink, the water goes through a filter, which filters out all of the impurities located inside the margin ice water and also other living organisms like bacteria and viruses if they exist as well. The bottle, um, the bottle will be made out of aluminum, not only because it acts as a good insulator from the negative 63 degrees environment on Mars, but also due to the existence of aluminum oxide in the Martian soil. So that materials needed for production can be easily sourced when we start harvesting from the natural resources on Mars. Although large scale terraforming and emulating the Earth environment may not be possible in the near future when we colonize Mars, but products like these make it one step closer to recreating and rebuilding the society we have on Earth. Thank you. Perfect timing. I have a question. Do you expect uh, people will be using this bottle while they are outside? So I mean, I mean, they are, they are in a suit, or do they're going to be using this in like indoor protected space? Uh, because because if it's metallic and you have your bare hand on it, it will stick to your skin, right? Like, um, do you think it's something to use with a space suit or just in a protected indoor area? I think this product would be used in the indoor area, but then the reason why this product is created is, is because when you're traveling around Mars, it is very cold on Mars, so then that will make, um, so then like you won't have anything to drink, but then the bottle makes it so it's perfect to drink whenever you want to drink it when you're in an inside area. Thank you. Hi, Fagel. Um, I think it was an excellent presentation. I liked your style of problem definition that you, that it's almost like you looked for a problem. Um, I just thought that the section on the filter was a bit of a, a little bit light on. Um, what, did you do any research of what specifically needed to be filtered from the Martian water? Um, currently, the studies show um, um, don't show any specifics about what is in um, what is in the Martian ice. So then, I can only um, so um, there aren't any facts about what is in the Martian ice. So then, I made a general assumption that it would be similar to how we filter our water on Earth. Okay, great, thank you. You said that eventually it could be made from the local material? Yeah, because, because there is aluminum oxide in um, inside the Martian soil. So then if we do start to harvest from Mars, then um, then we won't have to ship aluminum from Earth, but then we can process it on Mars. If we do harvest um, natural resources from Mars. Great, thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Then we have uh, Bavisha. Oh, you're very fast. Okay, great. Living on Mars will require us to adapt to conditions that we can barely imagine. One area of concern being the several psychological implications this uncertain environment and the lengthy space flight of two to three years could pose on our mental health. Thus, to promote a more 
positive idea of this flora and to ease the stress associated with living on Mars, this is where red earth comes in. Red Earth is a meditation well-being application that aims to help users cherish the memories on Earth, Earth to evoke nostalgia yet calmness through meditation-themed tracks related to nature, such as waves, rain, and birds. Red Earth also aims for users to embrace the unique aspects of Mars rather than fear it through a cloudy design and through planet frequency-themed meditation tracks to better adapt with the new environment and to welcome the idea of further space exploration. Well, conducting user research. Most people are interested in meditation, but are not as educated about it or can't adapt to it daily. Therefore, I optimized my app with the goal to establish user loyalty. Visual elements such as icons, rounded tabs on elements, and my phone choice were replicated from Instagram. This creates a more intuitive system and a sense of familiarity. Thus, users are more confident in their abilities and would be more inclined to use this app on a daily basis. A consistent color scheme of green, red, and white has been used to create synergy and to mesh these unique cool elements of Earth and Mars together. This application will have guided articles for beginners as well as news for more experienced users or more or different tax, tactics of meditation or wellness. This way I can cater to a larger demographic and accommodate all user needs in this rising industry, making my app more accessible and universal to all. I aim to create a community through interactive media features. Users have the op option to exchange photos, videos, articles, or simply chat with friends, share GIFs, or share memes, on, or simply their journey of meditation as they reach their well-being goals. They set through the activity option to track their process progress, which they can look back on at a daily basis to see their achievements. Customizable push notifications will be sent on a daily basis to help ingrain the app into the user's lifestyle. Thus, this added information and interactive features create, creates a more desire to use the app, which in turn, which in turn could pr promote a, a better uh, well-being lifestyle uh, through meditation. As the space industry grows, this will subconsciously help users adjust to the idea of 4D printing or even adapting to a new lifestyle or normalizing this new lifestyle on Mars that would originally be deemed as too futuristic or unachievable. Thus, this will give me a first mover advantage as if I were to turn this into a business in the sphere of how media will evolve into a more purposeful educational platform and with a unique selling point of how a social media platform like Red Earth, of Red Earth over here can benefit your mental health. very much i think this is um this is one where we need the feedback from from people who do mental health <laughs> apps so uh, zara and martin i think you you're going to be uh, interested in this or have an opinion strong opinion on that hi yeah uh it's a great presentation really i think it's one of the <laughs> um we see a, like a lot of pictures and having to design them so very well put together app and like you really thought through all the elements there um i was just wondering is that uh kind of an immediate in terms of the timeline for this brief is it something um did you have a timeline set for this um so the, the, the reason i'm asking this is um so it's i can see this app working right now here um, and I guess um, in terms of just incorporating more uh, environments within which people will live one day on Mars. And um, I, I see it as an app that works here very well right now, but I don't, I don't see much of them taking into consideration kind of Martian um, constraints uh, within this app. So I was just curious in terms of the timeline. A uh, timeline as in uh, how I made this or when will this be implemented? yeah well, when do you see this working is it like initially as the first as the first kind of settlers are there or once you know people are kind of settled there I think, already um uh maybe this could be implemented like few years uh before to maybe ease people into this idea more and i feel like in terms of uh, given the current situation um as people are quarantined they're more likely to meditate or try different hobbies or um since it's anyway the idea of space um Maybe I could bring in some elements of astrology as um, that trend is growing and more millennials are more inclined to follow that. You know, I was, uh, I was mentioning to you, like you really want to show this app in the hands of an astronaut or somebody yeah. who's on Mars, as in a way that we can start to understand, like how does it fit into a life on Mars? Um, 
is it because um, so do you think that when the people we are actually going to live on Mars we will have something like an iPhone this is the kind of interface we will have in the future uh, I feel I feel like there will be more a wearable technology for sure um, and I, I feel like app will, apps will always remain because it's so accessible but uh, in terms of how it's going to develop I'm still not sure about that sphere I made it more towards um, just um, like app design from 2020 or 20 like 2019. Hey, hey uh, Martin here, also from mine. So yeah, yeah, nice presentation. Um, I agree with Zara, it's really well designed, but it does seem very earthly. I mean, for one, uh, maybe we're not gonna be carrying around iPhones on Mars. You know, just maybe, maybe we will, but maybe not. Uh, the other thing is, and maybe, maybe you misspoke, I'm just curious, did you say astrology? Uh, integrating astrology? Uh, yeah, because, um, oh yeah, sorry. I started off this project researching uh, millennial trends and I feel like um, there was a 52% rise from 2016 to 18 for trends like astrology or like wellness, meditation, self-care app. So that, that was what inspired me to go to, uh, towards um, putting in planet, uh, things like planet frequency tracks as well. Um, just a suggestion on that front, I think what I, uh, I would suggest to look into kind of what kind of people do you think will be the people on Mars initially? Um, and, you know, so the, the background, I assume there'll be a lot of scientists there um, and, you know, so, so people that will be able to kind of build and live within those environments initially. So those trends might not be aligned, um, you know. I mean, the millennials might not be the kind of group you want to look at and think about when you're kind of implementing that. Um, so just something to research a little bit more in terms of the context. Oh, true, thank you. Sorry, Caesar. is there room for one last comment? Oh, go ahead. Um, Babasha, really beautiful prototype. I'm super impressed by the fidelity. Um, but maybe one angle you could frame this project in, it's a little bit apart from the brief, but I like that you're really focusing on sort of like wellness and sort of adjusting to what life is like in space and addressing previous comments where people have mentioned the maybe like earthliness of apps and iPhones. Maybe you could frame this as sort of like a therapeutic, um, like transitionary digital experience for that strange phase we'll have when we start to migrate people over to Mars. Maybe it's part of like a program where um, we, we help assimilate people into this new life that they have. And you could really uh, approach the, the problem from a sort of how do we cultivate a new sense of wellness in outer space, um, but also using familiar languages and mediums that we're already familiar with on Earth. Uh, so maybe that could translate to you building an app that could be branched out into whatever um, technology we end up using when that's maybe like built into our astronaut suits or whatnot, um, thinking beyond the app, but also centralizing the app as the main bridge between human, er like, yeah, Earth humans and Martian humans. But yeah, really amazing prototype. Well done. Thank you so much. Great. That's coming from uh, somebody who is a professional UX designer, so. <laughs> um, who's going to go next? We have then uh, Erika. Erika. Hi. Um, gonna... Can you guys see my screen? Yes. Yes. Um, um, can you guys see my uh, wait a sec, I'm just okay. looking. Yeah, I'll reset the timer so I'll give you the time. Oh, sorry. There's a, I'm looking for my, okay. You might have like multiple screen uh, enabled. So you want to have like a single screen or show your current screen. So uh, you can, uh, get out of the screen and then share it again. So okay. uh, unshare your screen and then share it again. Okay. And then you will have a function okay. that can share like a copy of your current screen. Uh, so at the bottom, share screen, and then you can choose what section of the screen you want to share. Oh, okay. You see that? Yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, I have no and idea which screen it's in. You just share what you see is, is what we see as well as the easiest one. Okay. Top left hand. But then would you be able to see my notes as well? Uh, perhaps, but don't, don't worry about it. Okay. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, it's up to you. Of course, if you change right. your presentation is better, uh, but ah. yeah, it's up to you.
Okay, I'm just gonna try this again. Maybe what we'll do for the next uh, time we do a presentation, I will recommend if it's still um, not face to face but online, I will ask you to do oh, so. I think it's an issue with um, because I keep getting a pop up saying it won't, like, because this is recorded, it won't let me record, I think. Maybe I make you a co host and maybe it will, uh, it will allow you. Can you try again? Uh, yeah. Okay. How about now? You are the co-hosts now. Yeah. Um, it's saying I have to quit to let it. Uh, okay. In this case, we're gonna go with Tanya, and then you try to figure out this uh, technical issue, and then come back. If you need to get out and come back, should let's do that. Okay. 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 We we'll see you. Sorry. We'll see you. No problem. Uh, Tanya, are you there? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay, all right, so my project was, is a magazine, a monthly lifestyle publication, which is an everyday object on Mars. And this would assume that we have colonized Mars and that it has been uh, quite a few decades um, of living successfully on Mars. So the project brief says that we should aim to uh, make projects that are either to fulfill essential survival needs or to respond to more complex and higher needs, which is what I would be uh, dealing with today. So my result is a publication that indirectly depicts the culture, the norms, and the contemporary visionaries that are relevant to this period. So um, as an everyday object, we do have um, design publications, we have news, we have articles, we have all sorts of things. And I just believe that media is such a powerful tool and that I can shape culture in that aspect. And I believe that that's something as an everyday um, object on Mars. So I based off my research and preparation through multiple sources. Um, and A to D are basically the points I want to keep in mind in my content. So I'll be weaving in these type of uh, predictions on the lifestyle of Mars in my content. Um, this is my vision and my creative flow. My assumption, which is important, is that life on Mars is successful and ever-growing and that the connections between Mars and Earth are strong and space tourism is growing. So my contents are quite, um, they're structured to have these predictions uh, weaved into it. And as you can see earlier, it's, there, there's the reference to MoMA. So I'm assuming that this would be um, a collaboration uh, that MoMA has with M Mars. As you can see here, this is the forward, and here are the different types of content that will be here. So Winnie was actually one of the uh, presenters earlier in this exhibition, and I incorporated her work along with two other designers, Bavisha and Erica, and I also incorporated my own original content, so what I think that magazines will have eventually in 2051. And I, I personally would think that maybe NASA and MoMA would have some sort of collaboration, um, the first ever space museum um, on Mars. And I guess uh, one of the project requirements and also maybe one of the limitations of this um, relatively more artistic project is that the sustainability to say uh, is only as sustainable as life on Mars is. So it doesn't um, contribute directly like the other projects. Um, but the power of media and content is immense and it, it is going to be powerful, especially in a stable society. So I believe it can drive in direct perspective and culture can only really be properly created when the basics are sorted. So as Phil mentioned before, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, we all know it, um, it would be directed more so towards the top three rather than the bottom two. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Um, hi, it's Zara here from Mind. Um, I really love this. I think it's such a great thing to think about and that often gets overlooked. And it's similar to um, the fashion project. Again, it's I think those, those things that often we don't think about as necessities, but I think are very, very important for various reasons. Um, the one thing to add, just uh, similar to um, the previous project, uh, I think the interface is something maybe to look into. So there's content, but also how we interface with that, um, you know, with its printed media and like within Martian environments, what other ways um, of interfacing will be emerging uh, and how they will be relevant to, um, to the environment and to that way of life. I, I think that's somewhere you could possibly research and explore a little bit more. Um, so what you mean is that you don't expect like paper print? Is that what you're saying? Um, well, not alone, perhaps. I mean, that's something that you know we we will and we can still have there. But I think it just opens opportunity for additional interfacing. You know, whether it's paper print, the audio, um, and you know something else. I would like to see a little bit more you kind know, of exploration into different additional interfaces with the content. Sorry, I must have not uh, mentioned, I probably was speaking too quickly, but yes, I agree. Um, I think that for this one, the interface could be quite diverse. Um, when I mean mm -hmm. magazine, I don't mean um, just physical mag magazines, because in 2051, anything can happen, right? So I'm also assuming that it would be digitized as well. So um, I agree, like there's probably a little bit more uh, research that needs to be done, but it's not just limited to the scope of physical um, content and physical media. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Yeah, I mean, I guess in your presentation it would be great to see just to get that uh, imagination going. Um, yeah, if you could. Think yeah. Of Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so, Erica, are we able to get back to you? Uh, yeah, I think so. I'm just gonna. Uh, do it like this. Okay. Can you guys see my screen? It's working. Can you guys see this part, like the full yeah. screen? It's perfect. We can see the screen. Yeah. Okay. Um. So my project is called Be Well Marswear. It's a, a fashion line made for the new generation on Mars. The aim behind this design is to create um, Marswear that combines fashion and technology to create clothing that can positively affect one's well-being. So traditionally speaking, well-being is a state of being comfortable, healthy, or happy. And although these terms are important, I think this term has to be revised for life on Mars. Uh, what is comfortable on Mars? What can keep you healthy on Mars? What can make you happy on Mars? Through this design, these questions are answered. Um, a key component of this design is that it aims to be forward-thinking and is not limited by what is already in existence, but aims to see how the objects of today can inspire future projects. Um, uh, uh, at the beginning of my research, I focused mainly on spaceware, not realizing that there's actually a difference between Marsware and spaceware. Um, this novel by Dr. Bar Barbara Browning um, explains um, spaceware um, and zero gravity um, fashion. Um, I also looked at um, quite current uh, spaceware, like this one from Under Armour. Um, this artist, Christopher Rayburn, who makes um, clothes for Mars that isn't really practical, but focuses on the ideas of recycling. Um, and um, the, um, sorry, um, these sensors that can help track your stress levels and stuff, which is something I included in my design. So when thinking about what is comfortable, I had to keep in mind that idea of comfort is subjective to each person. So I came up with the idea of making pajamas as that is um, the most comfortable type of clothing in, I could think of. The idea behind the pajamas came from my own experience with trouble sleeping. As during high school, I had a lot of stress. So I slept like on average four hours. So I imagine the stress on Mars would be a lot worse and having a good night's sleep has a lot of positive impacts on one's well-being. Um, from these questions I raised earlier, I realized that a lot of these questions are interlinked. Uh, what makes you comfortable can make you happy, and what makes you happy can make you healthy, and so on. Um, 
And I think all those ideas combined in the sleeping and sleeping habits. These pajamas are a technologically advanced version of traditional pajamas on Earth. The concept behind this is that it reminds the user of their home planet, which is why it, they look similar to clothing on Earth. The pajamas are also incorporated with an AI system that tracks various aspects of the user and calculates how to best maintain that person's mental and physical well-being. Um, these are some of my original sketches, which as you can see are more streamlined and can be assumed to be more streamlined versions of like space, like astronauts uniform and stuff. Um, and these are the prototypes I made using a online software called Marvelous Designer, which um, um, is used for video games and making CGI um, uh, clothing as I couldn't leave the house to buy um, actual materials. So this is the final design, which is very simple and loose fitting. The, uh, um, it's tightened around the wrists and the ankles and the chest where the sensors would be placed. And this is just a to show where the pressure is. So as you can see, it is a lot tighter around the ankles and at the top. Um, these are also just to show where where the clothing actually hits the body. Um, and these are the measurements. Yeah, I think I ran over time, but yeah. Thank you. Uh, questions. Um, hi, it's Sarah again from Mind. Um, um, yeah, I love the concept, um, fashion with kind of integrated tracking uh, for mental well-being. I mean, I'm biased because that's kind of what our interest and what we're working on. Um, so, um, yeah, just a question in terms of tracking. What exactly are you tracking? So you mentioned sleep, but have you thought in terms of uh, specific sensors? Um, um, yeah, uh, that was actually on one of my previous, uh, like, um, slides coming up. Um, so basically the system receives information from sensors placed in around the body and it'll track like the user's movement, heart rate, temperature, stress, um, and other stuff. And then it'll calculate how, like how to give the user, like it'll give the user feedback on how the user can do better both physically and mentally. For example, if the user's not being very active, the AI can can um, tell the person to be more active. And, and how then, are they receiving that feedback? Um, I was thinking like for uh, like the application of it in Mars, say if you're living indoors, which is probably what it would be like living there, it would be part of like a house system, <laughs> kind of like, like an Alexa <laughs> or a Google <laughs> for your home. Pardon? Oh, um, sorry. Uh, so it would be kind of like like a house system. So it has the AI has access to all things in the house, including the person. So yeah, I don't know if I answered your question well. Uh, yeah, no, that's yeah, that's one of the interfaces. Um, and I guess for me, it would be interesting to see a little bit more research and thought again put into that. So how does that uh, feedback back to the user, whether they're alone in the space? So it's a house system and it's voice based, but there, if there are other people, um, yeah. yeah. So how do they? I was thinking of having something like a like a speaker on the on the collar, like. Mm -hmm. on one of the colors but I imagine that that would be quite heavy and then it would kind of get the like the clothing would kind of droop. Mm -hmm. Have you thought of an maybe an earpiece or something right. more? Yeah maybe I guess. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Now, great idea. Like I said, just uh, it would be very interesting. I think there's so many interesting directions you can take it in terms of that interaction with the user and even specific incorporation within clothing. So, yeah, I think that's something to explore uh, further. It would be very interesting. Thank you. And there's a lot of um, space uh, and time to uh, wear pyjamas as well. So if you want to experiment, you <laughs> have a lot of time to try it. So that would be great. Erika, I had a question. Um, so basically what I find is that there's a lot of influence on the design based on how 
how you feel about the garment on earth but are there any special considerations about the the conditions on mars which has influenced your design whether it's temperature or anything else that you're going to be more indoors yeah i think i've focused more on the indoor aspect of it as there isn't a lot of research being done into what we would wear in like every day on mars apart from like space suits so i wanted to create something that was like it didn't involve all the survival needs and it was kind of just for the person so um yeah thank you thank you thank you very much and uh, the last person is matthew yep Um, can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay, uh, perfect. Um, so uh, I'm Matthew, and um, so for us to live on Mars, water would be in essential for where we settle down for uh, our first foundations, as almost all water on Mars today exists as ice, though it also exists in small quantities as vapor in the atmosphere. The only place where water Oh, ice is visible at the surfaces is at the North Polar ice cap, but abundant water ice sources are also present beneath the carbon dioxide ice cap at the Martian South Pole and in the sh shallow subsurface at the more temperate conditions. Despite this, th this more than 21 million kilometers cubed of ice has been detected at or near the surface of Mars, which is enough to cover the whole planet to a depth of 35 meters. Therefore, I have decided to design a drill that would be able to drill into the surface of Mars and collect the water that may exist in certain areas, providing a better long-term solution to collecting water on Mars. My inspiration has been based on existing drills that are portable and designed at a small scale. Drills that are used for making holes in the, gra uh, in the ground or wood or in wood, and even to drill deep down to the ground to make wells. So this is a prototype that I have designed that I've came up with as more of a portable drill that would be able to drill into the surface and obtain the sources of water in craters or as previous mentioned, uh, water sources. So the diagram on the top right is based off the Omni processor, which is used as a physical a biological and chemical treatment processor uh, to process uh, f f a mixture of human ex excrete, excrea and water. This would apply in a Mars setting as it would remove pathogens, but also to mainly remove objects in between like soil and rocks. I plan to have a small scale omni processor. If not, then a similar water treatment system in general fits at the rear end of the drill. As, as I plan to have this design to have currently uh, extract water, which will come from the middle of the drill bit and to be filtered and be able to drink, drank immediately. I plan to do this with exi the existing design of spacesuits. So the current, uh, the current spacesuit which exists has an in-suit drinking bag, which is a plastic pouch mounted inside the, of the upper torso of the spacesuit. I also plan to use this feature of the drill where I have designed uh, to connect both the, the drill and the space suit with a tube for immediate consumption. Uh, this would be mainly for explorers as it would be more feasible to collect water during expeditions as I would expect that the first settlements would have one of the main objectives to explore the surroundings of the settlement. This drill would allow these expeditions to be extended and trapped explorers to tra travel vast areas. Thank you. Right. It's a, just a really quick remark before the questions come in. Uh, it's very um, impressive to see the difference between your design and the one of Fergal. I think the goal is the same, right? It's just to like defrost and treat water. But yep. Fergal assumed that it's just going to be like a very small package and you're yeah. going to be this very big machine so uh yeah. why do you think you need um, a very big machine or do you, what do you think about Fergal's design i don't i don't mean to be like, putting you against each other but i want to understand like the different consideration oh um that's okay so um because 
I was thinking more about um, how the first uh, settlements would be scientists and how they would, it, it, it would uh, compared to the scale of Mars, it would be a very small area. And besides uh, other, I don't know, like other technical Mars missions, uh, a definite main mission would be to explore Mars and the vast, with the surroundings of Mars basically and the areas around it so like this would help the scientists to explore Mars with with like with uh, like vast air areas thank you hi if I may just jump in for a bit Please. I think what is good about Matthew's one is that the context of his one and my one is different because I made an assumption that um, that um, that mine will be used when people are living on Mars, but then his one has to uh, be used during exploration and when people are still exploring Mars. So it's interesting to see how how those two different contexts have such a big effect on a design yeah yeah thanks a lot any other question hey martin martin here um love this great idea i think uh, you know extending the the exploratory capability um, especially in the early days is super super important so this was focused on water and sorry if I missed something um, I, I think you know you could combine since you're I, I think you call it an omni processor uh, if you're extracting water from the from the surface of Mars as you're traveling super important you know you can at the same time also extract oxygen right with ele electrolysis or something so you can combine you can pack even more things into it so it's kind of a really a self-contained kind of uh, uh, yeah, multi-purpose tool that you carry with you. And uh, you yeah. Water, oxygen, um, maybe fuel as well while you're at it. Yeah, I just thought at the start uh, to think of a smaller scale, but uh, for oxygen, I guess there can be like uh, like moving rovers that uh, move automatically to collect uh, like these supplies like by themselves, like water and oxygen for like rocket fuel as well, and they can like circle around certain areas that have been guided and return. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But yeah. it wasn't the point of this tool that you carry it with you, like the, the, the explorers, right? That they carry it with them, they stick it in the ground, it takes uh, stuff, let's say ice, uh, extracts ice, processes it. Um, is that, that's the point, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah. So anyway, yeah. I, I guess you could pack more than you know multiple yeah. functions. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Nice. Nice. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, actually, we have everybody as presented now. Um, thank you so much. So before we uh, we kind of uh, wrap it up, I'd just like to have a general feedback from uh, from the guests. Like, what's your what's your impression? Uh, so people who, uh, who what's your impression? So maybe Zara or Martin or Celine. Chiki. Um, I can go first. Uh, thank you very much for sharing this. I've really, really enjoyed this. So yeah, thank you for inviting us. Um, I'm really impressed with just the diversity and kind of the quality of work. Um, and it was interesting to see how some people obviously put a lot of um, um, effort and kind of spend a lot of time really researching things. Uh, whereas, you know, some project, other projects might not have gone so much into research, but then the kind of the creativity was really there and like very kind of different ideas. So yeah, really enjoyed that. One thing that probably would be useful just to set a context is that timeline. So for me, sometimes I think from the beginning, if you kind of said, well, this is kind of, this is the timeline I'm thinking about, then it helps to, I think, understand and judge the, the product better um, because it does make a difference, right? And I think also creatively it gives you that space to really think about, okay, I want to do it a bit further on the, you know, in the timeline. So what does that process of kind of evolution and development look like up until that point? Um, but yeah, thank you very much. Really enjoyed that. That's a great feedback. And I think we'll incorporate that element actually in, uh, in when we work together with uh, Zara and Martin. Uh, we'll be much more specific, I think, about the timeline. So, uh, so at least when you present, everybody will know exactly 
the technology is dated from that particular year? Is it like 2020 or three, year 3000, year 4000? Uh, ladies will have a better indication. Thank you for, for your feedback, Sarah. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I agree. Um, you guys, yeah. sorry, you want to go ahead? No, no, go ahead, go ahead. I can go after. Oh, sure. Um, I think you guys went in like every possible direction from the brief, which I think is really cool, which means that it, I think it was obvious that a lot of you have um, like pre existing interests that you just pursued down the path of what does this look like on Mars? And I think that's a great way to go. Like, definitely explore what you know. Um, but to uh, Sarah and Marcin's point, I agree. I think if you frame it within um, more specific parameters, uh, it'll be easier also to sort of deconstruct the problem and be clear about which problems you're addressing and in what instances they may appear. Because I think when you're, especially when you're doing speculative or like futurist design, it can get really easy to get lost in sort of the uncertainties of what hasn't happened yet. So to have like a really concrete imagination and to lay down the world that this object or this idea exists in is really helpful in communicating your idea. But otherwise, uh, really cool to see everyone's ideas um, and congrats on a great project. Uh, I'll just quickly jump in, Martin, here. Uh, I agree with both of the, you know, with Zara uh, and um, uh, Cecile. Uh, so yes, very varied, interesting ideas. Um, the thing I would stress, I think, the most is like uh, you should not underestimate just like how hostile the Martian environment is. It's extremely cold. You know the the radiation, obviously, uh, the low pressure, um, the the ground has the the regolith is like you know very. It has a lot of toxic toxicity in the soil. So like almost every step of the way at every corner, there's something that will either kill you or destroy the base. So uh, maybe for your future projects, like if you think about that, like that, you could think a little bit more about that because it's, um, it's really not like building or designing something for Earth. So if every, at every step, like um, you should have, think about like, okay, what about if uh, the pressure fails in the building or, uh, and you suddenly have to, you know, your clothing has to suddenly survive at least for a minute so you can get to a safe place or, you know, so th there's, um, yeah, it's uh, it's a nasty place to to live in, but uh, I mean we're going there for sure. But it's it's not going to be uh, as easy uh, to survive there. So I think that could be something you guys can think about a little more. Just to add to that, kind of a positive ending. I think <laughs> <laughs> it's no. I think all these constraints actually open a really great space for inventiveness and creativity because when you really set yourself you know hard constraints like it really pushes you to think a lot more and you know i think you can really come up with more with more interesting designs rather than you know get kind of discouraged by the hostility of the whole thing so yeah no it's a great challenge right i mean i'm, I'm not yeah you guys came up with some really interesting ideas thanks and thanks cesar thanks cesar for inviting us this is this is uh, fun to listen to My pleasure. Yeah. Uh, michael Oh, Michael just just left. Sorry, no, no, I'm here. I apologize. Um, I would like to thank everyone for their presentation and their quality of um, the quality of design and presentation. Um, I would echo some of the other uh, mentors, let's say, comments that um, it would be good to see um, some sort of scale of preference so so the preference the preference would be that you need to breathe and stay alive and let's just assume that they're already sorted and then let's think about mental health so it would be good to know uh, time frame and where this fits on the colonization of mars time frame so is it the first colony the first landing or is it after 20 years of building infrastructure on Mars. But I thought it was very interesting and everyone uh, presented very well. Thank you. And thank you, Cesar. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Chiki? 
Hello. Um, thank you so much for um, all the hard work. I think uh, it's really impressive to see how um, you have covered different aspects of life on Mars. So it's not just the basics, which is about food, water, and clothing, and housing, um, but also about well-being. Um, I think some of the things which might be helpful, especially considering a lot of us are working from home now, and we don't have access to uh, something very basic that we had in the past, the ability to just get out and meet people, go and um, you know, play a sport. So maybe if you can use some of that insight into what it would be like uh, or what kind of challenges people would face mentally uh, when they would be on Mars, whether it's about food, whether it's about meeting other people, um, yeah, so even in terms of well-being, uh, while we are taking what we have today and taking it ahead, if you extrapolate what is happening today, well-being is not just about, um, uh, it has a different meaning in the context of not being able to be in a natural surrounding. So I think if you can apply some of that, that might be helpful. Uh, but overall, I think it's really interesting, very creative. It's not easy to put yourself in an alien situation and try and imagine what it would be like. And um, uh, there's a lot of research that's been done. Uh, maybe a bit more um, contextual re research might also help. Um, but overall, I think it's been really good. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I guess um, the last person to give the feedback. So um, my first feedback is because I've seen the uh, the process. You know, for me, it's always so stressful because I invite guests, and I'm and I'm thinking, oh my God, they, they you know, like last week, you you were so far from being done. <laughs> so every time I'm just like, well, what are they going to show? So I'm very relieved, and uh, I congratulate you for the the work you have done. I think uh, given the circumstances, um, the stress and the isolation due to the virus, I'm I really. Uh, I uh, commend your 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 work. So, so that's the first thing I'd like to say. Um, that say, um, also you have, I, I think the thing that almost all of you, um, you want to get into prototyping earlier. Because for many of you, the, the prototypes just appeared just this session, kind of, uh, kind of uh, out of the blue. And it's a great, great uh, surprise. But I would say that you will learn so much more if you started prototyping in the earlier stage. So I'll take the example of uh, Oscar. I think your prototype was super impressed. You know, it's the uh, agar, agar, the material that you have. I think it's super interesting. Uh, but I, I had no signs of it coming like in, in, the, in the lead to, to today. So I think if you had a, a couple of more uh, weeks uh, to actually prototype with it, you could actually have built a structure with it. I'm sure you, you, you're able to do that. Um, had you uh, started to prototype earlier? So that's the first feedback. And I think that's true for, for most of you. Uh, the second feedback is about uh, how you present. So uh, because Mars is such a, um, a foreign space, uh, if you start by uh, presenting and introducing research, that's great. It's very, uh, very academic. Uh, but I would say that you could achieve an even stronger result if instead of telling us, for, for, I'll take the example of uh, Tanya. I think your work is, is super interesting, but because you explain it, instead of letting us experience it, then we don't really have the chance to uh, get into it. You see what I mean? So uh, I feel that it's really, really good work, but I would rather just see the newspaper and be like, wow, this is what life on Mars, this is what people are saying about what's happening. Um, because I feel this is, this is what I would, so, so if you tell us some of the headlines, you know, like this has happened and this has happened. Um, or for example, like, uh, let's say if, uh, if you build a garment, in the case of Winnie, if you are wearing it and if you show us how you use the knot to attach yourself, I think that would, like a demonstration would would uh, would replace a thousand words, and you would see. Okay, I get it. Like, so what I'm saying is that instead of presenting, consider uh, acting. I think acting and immersing us in the in the reality that you that you want to create would be so much stronger. So, for example, you could do like uh, two minutes of us immersing you in this world, and then one minute after you present us the background research. So this will be like, will be transported into your universe because it's your imagination you're talking about. And then after that, you can go into, I propose that idea because, you know, in Mars, the, 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 there's lots of water, but it's iced. But because we will have experienced it before, like, it would make, it would make so much more sense. Um, and the last, which is not a feedback, 
it's, um, it's kind of a segue into uh, what we're going to do next. So we have Zera and Martin here, and they are going to be uh, with us uh, in, the next, uh, in the next phase of the project. So I, I kind of uh, would like to, uh, to use this opportunity to, to sort of uh, segue into uh, what's coming next. Uh, so just before I segue, just make sure that if you have evaluated the student, uh, that you press on the submit button. Otherwise, all the data that you have entered the last so just want to. So we have finished the phase one, um, and you've done a great work. I hope that we can feature your work on on the website. I will ask you to send me the, the documentation. Uh, but part two is coming. So part two, we're going to be working with uh, Martin and uh, Zera. But what I wanted to mention is that uh, it's kind of a, a comment, and at the same time, it's a transition. A lot of the things that you have presented, uh, they have been about uh, humans staying the same. So we assume that the humans as are basically remaining humans as they are today, living in a hostile environment that is Mars. And then you design sort of a cocoon and protection around them. But there's a whole different way to approach it, which is how we redesign the human mind. How do we redesign the human body so it adapts to this new environment? I mean, uh, if we project ourselves much further from now, when we have terraformed Mars, um, uh, let's say if we project ourselves like a thousand years from now, uh, and the atmosphere becomes half breathable. Let's uh, imagine that in the future, we're going to start mixing the atmosphere that we bring from Earth or that we produce, and little by little start to mix it with Martian uh, atmosphere. And so we will basically start to form and change the human body. And instead of uh, using, for example, sounds that we import from Earth to make us feel better on Mars, Imagine if we little by little like start to insert the soundscape of Mars into the human, into the human ear and therefore uh, changing the human ear. Uh, so we're gonna be working with, uh, with them. Uh, I won't tell you too much about the, the next brief because I want to, uh, to keep a bit of a surprise for, next, uh, for the next phase. But basically uh, we're gonna be uh, trying to, I think you've done already an amazing effort of imagination, but we're gonna go like, like a thousand miles even further than that. We're gonna go like when we, when we are able not to only change and use the technology to shield us from our environment, we will use the technology to merge us with the environment. When we merge with technology, how that, 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 does this look like? So this will be the, uh, the next brief. So the idea is how we can enable humans to adapt to Mars. And we're gonna be designing interfaces and will be uh, joining from the uh, you know, neuroscience uh, background from uh, Martin and the design and creativity from Zera. And they have a startup and they have a very strong network with the Mars Society. Uh, so they're gonna be introducing us to really a futurist uh, thinker. So I think this is gonna really help you to, uh, to stretch your imagination even further. And so the idea is that, yes, I know we don't have access to um, a lot of uh, prototyping equipment, but because this is gonna be a highly creative um, uh, brief, uh, that I think that even in the worst case scenario, even if we all have to stay home, it would actually be a fertile ground, uh, ground to think about uh, this uh, new isolated and, and, and alien environment. So again, uh, I really want to thank you all. Um, I really, uh, really enjoyed uh, listening to all of your projects. Uh, th uh, thank you a lot for the guests uh, that have uh, given feedback and uh, feeling the evaluation. And um, I look forward to see you next week. See you guys. Looking forward to speaking soon. Thank you very much. Yeah, looking forward to the next stage and to working with all of you. Thank, Thank you, you Sela. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you, guys. Bye. Thank you, Lara. Thanks. Bye.